Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the Apple M1 Ultra and also the AMD Threadripper Pro 5000 series and why these are very consequential for the next generations of servers and workstation chips that are coming out. Now, you may be wondering, hey, Patrick, aren't you a little bit late to the game on this? And the answer to that is clearly yes. And I'll just tell you the quick reason why. While the Apple announcement, we actually covered the Threadripper Pro announcement on the STH main site, but while the Apple announcement was going, I was actually on a plane up to Calgary and we're gonna be doing some stuff with some liquid cooling and supercomputers. That's gonna be super cool. You're gonna see it pretty soon. Um, honestly, that is this just, I saw the first cut of it just a couple hours ago and it's just absolutely blowing my mind. It's super cool what, what was gonna come out and be on the STH YouTube channel. So definitely subscribe for that. But I do wanna at least come back and at least talk about the M1 Ultra because I think it is gonna be something that in the industry we're gonna reference in the future. And so I figured let's go talk about that and how these actually go and are gonna inform what we're gonna see in terms of server and high-end workstation CPUs that are not from Apple over the next couple quarters. So walking through the quick history of the Apple M1 or Apple Silicon line, we're not gonna talk about the you know A15 or A14, any of those kind of things, but let's just talk about the M series. So we started out with the M1 and that was pretty much the lower end processor. It's the first one that we saw, and it was in products like the Apple Mac Mini. We've already done things on the STH main site, looking at things like putting those in racks. We also have done things like doing 10 gigabit ethernet and looking at that version. And you know, I think those things were good. I also personally not just tried the Mac Minis, but I also had a 13 inch MacBook Pro, and that had the M1 and also 16 gigabytes of memory. And so I've tried pretty much, you know, a pretty wide swath of the M1, and it was good, but there were Definitely some things that you would notice because there are things like, you know, you couldn't upgrade the memory or the RAM on it. So you got kind of stuck with like either eight or 16 gigabytes. And in both versions, even the 16 gigabyte version, I would definitely notice just kind of weird things as you were actually using the machine. Cause I used it for a while. And one of the things as an example is I would be sitting there and I would be switching between tabs and it would take a long time to load a tab. And like, kind of like a crazy long time. Cause I have like slower machines that are clearly way better at it, but they have more memory. And so I think what was really happening and when I kind of looked into what was happening was, you know, you're basically out of that 16 gigabytes of memory that's on the package. And so the Mac had to go say, oh, we got we to go get something from disk. And then you had a really slow, you know, read from disk, and then you'd bring up the tab and you could actually see that when you're going through the UI. Now, some people, they don't really do that much stuff on their machines, so they won't ever notice that, but I certainly did. And so that was the reason that I ended up upgrading to the M1 Max. Because when the M1 Max came out, that was a 64 gigabyte machine, had some new stuff. And I said, well, I don't know about the Pro, but I definitely need the Max. And I got that in the 14 inch version. And that's actually my notebook that I've been using for the last couple months. And really that M1 Max is kind of the basis for the M1 Ultra. The M1 Ultra is basically two of these M1 Max chips. So that's kind of why I want to just talk about the experience with that. And frankly, the M1 Max notebook that I have is just absolutely 100%. That thing is phenomenal. I definitely don't get the same slowdowns that I got on the 16 gig ones because I have enough memory for what I'm using. And just the fact that you have all of the media encoders or those media encoding engines that things like Premiere Pro and some of the other creative tools, because every once in a while I'm rendering something while I'm on a plane or something like that. And using the M1 Max laptop, that's absolutely no problem. And frankly, I actually think that there are some jobs that I go and render on the M1 Max that are faster than something like a, you know, 32 core Threadripper system or something like that uh, with a pretty beefy NVIDIA GPU. I actually think that the Apple is significantly faster and, you know, I've done a couple of them and you know you can definitely see some renders where you're like 40% faster and you're like, this is absolutely insane. So I think that Apple did an absolutely great job. But what they did with the M1 Max is they didn't necessarily say, okay, we're just gonna go have as many ARM CPU cores as we possibly can. In fact, what Apple did was something a little bit different. And specifically there, not only do you have the CPU cores, but you also have their GPU cores, you have the AI inferencing engines, and then you also, and this is super important, have accelerators for doing things like those video exports and transcodes that we do. Now in SDH, we've been doing a lot with accelerators. We've even looked at things like the Ice Lake Xeons and how things like using the AI acceleration, the crypto acceleration, all that kind of stuff, both to give you more performance, but also use less power. And so I think that that's something that, you know, just to me, really resonates the fact that, you know, this is a design principle that's going to happen more and more. We're going to see more of in the industry, both in the high-end workstation and server space where accelerators are going to be a big part of it. And certainly the accelerators are going to be varied based on workload, but 
do expect that in the future, the CPU core is not the only thing that we're gonna care about. We're also going to be caring about those accelerators. And looking at the M1 Ultra, basically what Apple did was they took two of those and they have a 2.5 terabit per second interconnect between the two dies. By using the M1 Max die and sticking them together, it means that Apple didn't have to go create a new die, which you know saves a lot in terms of, you know especially for like the higher end segment where you don't necessarily wanna go make a completely new thing. That actually saves you by being able to just take the design and stick them together. Of course, the packaging that Apple is using to be able to create an interconnect like that is certainly very, very advanced. So I don't wanna take anything away from that. We're not gonna get too much into that here because I wanna kind of keep this at a higher level, but it's the same reason that when we look at like AMD, for example, the AMD Threadripper Pro is basically an AMD Epic processor that is just, you know, it has a chipset and it's called a Threadripper versus an Epic. They're basically the exact same platforms. Uh, they're just kind of different differentiated in terms of what markets they're for. And the reason for that is, you know, the high-end workstation market only sells so many units. So it just makes sense to go use, reuse something that you already have. And so AMD is doing that. You see Apple doing that. And Intel even does the same thing in terms of their Xeons. So it's something that, you know, we just kind of see across the industry. And that's really, I think, why the M1 Ultra is the way it is. But putting those two together allows you to have up to 20 CPU cores between their performance and efficient cores. You also get 64 GPU cores and 32 neural engine cores. And again, that neural engine is really for that AI inferencing because we are seeing, I and mean, we are definitely seeing both Intel and Apple really focusing on AI inference and you know Nvidia does this too although they're not necessarily in the same notebooks and stuff as you know we see some of the other vendors but at the same time those two are definitely saying hey look there's more and more software that is using AI inferencing and so we need to have accelerators because it is so much less expensive if you can do AI inferencing with accelerators versus just using traditional CPU cores and so what you think about is that number 1 you're not using the CPU cores for that work and number 2 you're doing it more efficiently because you have some hardware offload and that's exactly what's going on both you know all the way in the Intel notebook line all the way up to the Intel Xeon Ice Lake so third generation Intel, Intel Xeon scalable you're definitely seeing that that AI inference acceleration is becoming a big part of modern CPUs there are some interesting things at least to me in terms of the ultra fusion so specifically at least to me one of the biggest things is the fact that you get a total of up to 128 gigabytes of LPDDR5 6400 memory, which is different than the DIMMs that you would put into a normal system. And it is something that we've seen other vendors say, hey, we might actually use that in our high performance computer chips. LPDDR5 offers benefits in terms of overall bandwidth, but it's also less expensive than HBM memory that we see on like GPUs and we're gonna see in future Sapphire Rapids CPUs. And so I think that that's something that, you know, just at least from my perspective is very interesting that these guys are doing it now. And I bet you that we're gonna see at least Intel and Nvidia follow suit in the next couple of years in their GPUs, or at least maybe their high-end GPUs for like, you know, supercomputers and stuff like that. I think it actually makes a lot of sense to start looking at that. So I wouldn't be surprised if Apple is gonna be alone on this. I think a lot of other folks are gonna follow suit. Now, because you have those two M1 Max chips using UltraFusion, it basically means that you would have four packages of that LP DDR5 6400 on each of the M1 Max dies, and then you have the interconnect between them. So some of the interesting things that Apple is gonna be doing, and you're, we're gonna have to see how Mac OS treats it, but you will see things like, they're gonna actually have to deal with the fact that there are gonna be CPU cores and GPU cores on either side of that interconnect. It's actually not as big of a deal in a lot of the AI inferencing stuff, but the CPU and GPU, and especially the GPU, there is a big deal about having an interconnect between them. Specifically, you know, are they gonna create like two NUMA nodes? Uh, it looks like that there's only gonna be one GPU interface. So somehow Apple is managing all of that on the back end, which is super cool. And they also say things like, hey, you can get more memory than the highest end GPUs with 48 gigabytes. And I was like, hey, we deal a lot with really high end GPUs. And I realized I had an Nvidia A40, which just happens to be one of those 48 gigabyte GPUs uh, right next to me. We're gonna have a review on this very, very soon, but we have done already systems where we have eight of these in a system. and so. Just the other thing that is important when you talk about the M1 Ultra and all of Apple's claims about being the best is also just the fact that, you know, well, this is one in my hand. We have already done systems with eight of them. We've also done systems with eight 
80 gigabyte GPUs, so A100 GPUs. We've done the 40 gigabyte A100s. We did the previous gens. I mean, so the fact is that you can scale up to like 640 gigabytes of memory in a server, but that's not necessarily a workstation GPU. So I, I kind of get where Apple is coming from there. And I do really want to see how it, Apple is handling this. So we did order the Apple M1 Ultra Studio, and we also have you know the 120 gigabytes of memory. So we ordered like the full configuration. It's crazy expensive. But on the other side, also it's not gonna be shipped, it says until like mid to late May. So that thing's not gonna come out for like another couple months, uh, which is just kind of interesting. It seems like a big pre-announce because I ordered it like, like right after the launch event and it's taking forever to get here. So um, that's kind of interesting as well. Now, something that when you look at the Apple performance claims, there are a couple of things that just kind of, you know, get real and just remember here for a sec, right? The fact of the matter is that when they talk about like their 28 core Xeons and their, you know, Mac Pros and stuff like that, I mean, you do have to remember that a 28 core Xeon in a Mac Pro is basically Cascade Lake and Cascade Lake is basically Skylake. So they basically are using like 2017 era CPU cores in that. And they're like, our 2022 stuff is gonna be way better. And you're like, of course it is like, of course. And if you look at the footnotes, like on the release and stuff like that, a lot of what Apple actually does is they're talking about things that are using some of those acceleration technologies, like the media encoders and like looking at ProRes and stuff like that. One of the reasons that they're doing that is because they actually have hardware accelerators for that. So, you know, when you do these tasks, like if you're using the hardware accelerators, it's like, of course it's gonna be good. And they're saying like, oh, it's better than our, our you know, Mac Pro with Afterburner. It's like, well, you guys made your own accelerator. So, um, you know, that that is what it is there, right? And something that I mentioned earlier, but let's just kind of get to it in terms of addressing it, is the fact that even with 128 gigabytes, that's not necessarily big in terms of a really high-end workstation. Now you may be saying like, hey, for my gaming computer, 128 gigabytes seems like a lot. Okay, now you know I'm already a pretty big fan of the M1 Max, but there is something that I do think is important, especially when you look at the Mac Studio and the fact that you can get up to 128 gigabytes with this you know, M1 Ultra. Apple saying like, this is totally revolutionary in terms of capacity, but it's also kind of not. And the reason for that is, you know, a modern CPU, like a modern modern high-end workstation CPU, even if you have a single socket CPU, something like a Threadripper Pro. Now, of course, Threadripper Pro will use a lot more power, but on the other hand, you can also load it up with a lot more stuff. For example, you can have things like you have eight channel memory, but in those memory channels, you do use older DDR4-3200, but you also get ECC memory. And the other important thing is the fact that you get more capacity, right? I use 64 gig DIMMs and pretty much everything that we've been deploying since kind of somewhere like mid 2021, we've been using 64 gigabyte DIMMs pretty much exclusively. And so what that practically means is that, you know, you have eight 64 gigabyte DIMMs and that gives you a total of 512 gigabytes of memory, but you can go up to a terabyte or more depending on whatever you want to go do. And the other thing is just frankly, you can put more PCIe peripherals there. So we have things that you're gonna see very soon. We're gonna have things like DPUs and we're gonna kind of show you how all that kind of stuff work, large storage arrays and all that kind of stuff with just, you know, high-end PCIe Gen 4 and having 128 lanes on Third Pro. So I think that Third Ripper Pro is certainly going to be a, you know, step above in terms of how big of a system you can make. But on the other hand, I really do think that the M1 Ultra and all of the accelerators that are built in, I think are definitely gonna be a game changer in that space. So I'm certainly very excited for it. And so with that, let's talk about the Threadripper Pro 5000 series. Now this is something that clearly should have come out a long time ago because the Threadripper Pro 3000 series that we've done reviews of, you know, a bunch on the STH main site, that series has really been focused on, you know, using Rome as the platform. So that's the Epic 7002 series. And basically it's a Rome CPU in the Threadripper Pro 3000 series, basically a Rome Epic that's been converted to workstation use. And then, you know, Milan came out almost a year ago. And, you know, ever since then, the Threadripper Pro is like, okay, so what, when are we going to get the Milan Threadripper Pro? Because, you know, it's way better. And it just never has happened. And now, basically, what AMD is going to do is they're going to take the Milan, this is a 7763, and they're basically going to go and turn that into a new chip, which is going to be the high end Threadripper Pro. And you're also going to have you know, different core counts from like 16 cores up to 32 cores. And so that's what AMD is gonna do in terms of the Threadripper Pro series. Basically think Milan CPU for workstations. And you might be thinking, hey Patrick, what about Milan X? Like didn't AMD launch Milan X? So why are you just talking about Milan and why is Threadripper going to Milan uh, instead of Milan X? And, and all I'm gonna say is I'm not allowed to talk about Milan X, 
But if you want to learn about Milan X, something you'd be wise to do it would be to subscribe and stay tuned to SDH over the next couple days because um, I can't say why, but you just might want to do that if you're interested. But the AMD Threadripper Pro 5000 series is certainly a step up in terms of performance. But one of the things that I think at least is interesting is that Lenovo got the exclusive with the P620 again in terms of the upgrade. So when you saw these slides, the launch slides for the AMD Threadripper Pro 5000 series, again, they basically said, hey, we're it's in Lenovo. Now we did a review of the Lenovo you know, P620 system that this goes in. And, and you know, it was a nice system. We also did reviews of some of the platforms when you don't necessarily use the Lenovo platform, but those didn't come out for a couple months later. And so that was kind of a bummer. And one of the big things that we found with that original P620 was that was the first non-Epic system that we saw that had Lenovo enabling AMD PSB and vendor locking CPUs. And one of the reasons that we found that out was actually because we had readers that were buying the P620, getting the lower end Threadripper Pro, and then expecting to be able to upgrade it for less than Lenovo would charge them. And then they found out that their old CPUs were vendor locked. So that's actually kind of how we found it. And it's just something that we've seen now in Lenovo's servers, we've seen it in Lenovo's workstations, and now we've also found, you know, AMD Ryzen PSB, we found that a couple months ago. And so, you know, they're even doing it kind of on their lower end machines as well. And so I think there are a couple themes then that we can talk about in terms of the future of chip design um, and things that are, at least to me, super interesting here, right? So first off, just on that AMD PSB thing, so think about that. That means that basically if you go and have one of these Lenovo systems and somebody takes out that Threadripper Pro 5000 series brand new CPU and goes tries putting it into an ASUS workstation board, it will not work, right? And so that practically means that there will be some you know, additional level, not, not initially when they're sold, but you know, down the line, there will be some amount of e-waste that's created by that AMD PSB feature being enabled by Lenovo. So that is a total bummer. And if you kind of look at the Apple, I mean, they kind of take it to the next level, right? I mean, what happens if your SSD dies? Well, soldered onto the motherboard in a lot of these systems. So you basically have to scrap the motherboard because your SSD died? Or let's say that you have some memory that faults and so your memory is gone. What are you gonna do? Well, you have to scrap the board because it's on the chip. Also, what if you wanna upgrade the system to more memory? Well, what do you do? Well, you basically have to go buy a new system. And so I think that what's really interesting about this and so the lack of upgradability in Apple's M1 ecosystem is kind of shocking. I mean, that's, that's literally the number one thing that uh, scares me. And the fact that a lot of the stuff in the Apple ecosystem, when it's not replaceable and upgradable, it's also, there's like not redundancy like you would get in a high-end workstation. That also kind of makes me pretty nervous as well. And so it's just something that, you know, you're noticing that like, Apple is using the fact that you can't upgrade things to go and charge you just crazy amounts for upgrades. I mean, like, you know, when you look at the SSD options and how much those cost, I mean, that's insane. How much the additional memory costs? I mean, that's, it's just crazy amounts that Apple is charging. And the reason is that you have no other choice, but on the flip side, because you have no other choice, that also means that there's gonna be more e-waste. And so Apple's saying like, oh, we have the greenest product and all that kind of stuff. But realistically, they are creating e-waste with this model. Now, Lenovo is doing the same by enabling AMD PSB, but to definitely a lesser extent because you do still have some swappability and upgradability. You don't have to throw away your entire platform just because something like a memory module died or a memory chip died. So one similarity between, I guess, the current Threadripper Pro system and also the Apple M1 Ultra systems is of course the fact that you are gonna have more e-waste by all of this kind of stuff. And then the other thing I think is interesting is just the fact that we are definitely getting into a world of multiple chiplet designs or multiple chip designs and putting those things together. So the Apple M1 Ultra, that interconnect that they have is definitely super cool. On the AMD side, we've seen the basic Milan and Rome, uh, you know, layout for a couple of years now, and it's definitely a big upgrade over what they had in Naples. But at the same time, it's about time to see something new. Something that is actually really interesting is that while I was up in Canada, I actually got to hold one of the Exascale Cray, HP Cray Shasta nodes. So these are these just, you know, crazy liquid cooled nodes that are going to go into like the fastest supercomputers that are going to come online this year. And in those, they actually had the AMD MI250X, which is like this crazy GPU. And one of the kind of just really interesting things interesting things to me at least, is if you actually look at those GPU packages that have to be liquid cooled, what you're gonna see is that you have 
two dies, which are your GPU dies, that are next to each other. And each of those has four HBM stacks next to it. And so if you look at that and you kind of look at it compared to the M1 Ultra, you look at it and you're like, hmm, I, I kind of see some similarities there. Now, of course, I think that Apple actually has a much higher end interconnect between the you know two different chips than AMD has in this version. But at the same time, it is just kind of interesting to kind of look at that and be like, well, that's... Uh, there's some similarities there, even just by eyeballing it. On STH, we just also covered the Universal Chiplet Interconnect Express 1.0 specification, which is really something that Intel, but also TSMC and a lot of other vendors like ARM and AMD and all these guys are on board. And they're basically gonna go take their IP and they're going to say, hey, you know, if you have a big enough use case where it makes sense, we're actually gonna go and let's say you have an accelerator that you wanna go co-package with our kind of normal cores and some memory and maybe some interconnect and uh, you know maybe some network fabric or something like that. We can go put that all onto a package and they have that going forward. And the reason that that's out, you know, you don't make that just for the heck of it. You do that because the future of big chips is really gonna be, you know, these kind of modular designs that can be put together or glued together. I always love using that term. I was actually in the room when that, that was presented. But the idea is basically that, you know, you can go and get these chiplets and put them together and have unique capabilities that are really tailored to specific markets. And that's really what we see with the Threadripper Pro and also the M1 Ultra. The Threadripper Pro is designed to go and just build just giant systems, lots of memory, lots of cores, lots of networking. You can put 100 gig networking on there, no problem, or 200 gig networking. You can do all kinds of crazy things on that system. We actually had a system that we did a video on YouTube where we had a Threadripper Pro system with, I think, like 1.4 terabits per second of, uh, of chips and even a whole bunch of ARM servers built in. So that was kind of an interesting thing that you can do with that kind of workstation. On the Apple side, they're definitely catering to the creative professionals with things like the Mac Studio and also the M1 Ultra, M1 Max and all these chips. These are really designed for the creative professionals that are doing things like exporting video. Now that I do that quite a bit, um, you know, especially after I get things back from the editors, I don't always do it, but you know, I do have to do it sometimes. And, you know, especially being able to do it on a plane is completely transformational especially when it's uh, good performance doing it on battery on the plane. Um, you, know, you definitely see the impact of having things like those accelerators. So I do think that, that is something that we're gonna see more of. And frankly, the industry is gearing up for that. So overall, this is a super exciting times. So we did a piece like a year ago on looking at saying, you know, hey, there's gonna be the gigabyte era on CPU. So CPU packages are actually gonna start saying like how many gigabytes they have on board instead of just having like megabytes of cash. And we're certainly seeing that, right? Apple's already at up to 128 gigabytes in their packages. We're gonna start seeing Milan X, which has up to three quarters of a gigabyte or you know 1.5 gigabytes of just cache, not even memory, on the chips themselves, which is um, mind-blowingly cool. Um, we're gonna explain a little bit more about that when we can. And then, you know, there is gonna be definitely new generations of stuff coming out over the next couple of weeks as well. Next week, we're gonna have some AMD news. We're also gonna have NVIDIA GTC. And for NVIDIA GTC, I'm just gonna plug real quick the fact that we are gonna be doing a RTX 3080 Ti giveaway on the STH main site. So for full details and all that kind of stuff, we'll have it on the STH main site. We're not gonna really do it on YouTube, but just definitely check that out and you can go figure out what we're gonna do in terms of giving away this thing. But overall, if you can't tell with how late this video is, I do not think that I am going to be sleeping over the next couple days because we just have so much coming that I'm just crazy excited about. And hey, if you did like this video, well, give it a like, click subscribe, turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos, especially the ones coming soon. And as always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.